Good morning, New Hope Community Church family and friends. Pastor J.E. Catterson here. And uh, we are excited that you um, are choosing to be with us uh, this Sunday morning, whether uh, you are in person or uh, watching us on the internet um, in the Northport, uh, Venice, Port Charlotte, Sarasota, Fort Myers area, or all throughout the globe. Um, we are starting a brand new ser sermon series, and it's uh, just going to be four short weeks, looking at um, our tradition in the Christian Mission Alliance where we affirm that Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and Coming King. And this week we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ as our Savior. And um, we uh, are just going to pause for just a moment before we look into the Word of God and just ask God to be ever-present with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of your Holy Spirit for the truth of your word. We thank you that 2,000 years ago you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross that our sins might be forgiven and that our life would be abundant and full. We thank you, uh, Lord Jesus, that you are our Savior, that you chose to not save yourself but to die that we might have our lives saved. We need to just ask now as we look into your word that you might bless it. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be focusing in on a marvelous story from Luke chapter 19, and then we're going to jump ahead to Luke chapter 23 in order to kind of get our minds and our hearts wrapped around what it means that Jesus Christ is our Savior. It is just a core foundation of what we call the fourfold gospel. And we're going to be just inviting you to go back with me 2,000 years ago to the city of Jericho. Now, Jericho was surrounded by palms and scented balsam groves. And when you think about everything that was in that city, dates, palm honey, myrrh, balsam, and it formed a continuous caravan of exports that went out to the east. Now, for the Roman government, you got to understand that this Jericho was a lush center for taxation, plump, ripe, and fragrant with revenue. They loved this city. And we see knee-deep into this entire process were the tax collectors. Right, you, you got to just understand, making sure that you know what was due to Caesar was given to Caesar, but in the process, a little denarii or two to themselves. And we could see that this spring morning there in Jericho, when Jesus was about to enter, that there's still a chill all along the early morning there in the dawn. And we see that all across the city that uh, there is an anticipation that is uh, just all around, not just for freshly minted coins of opportunity for taxes and for commerce, but we see that in the minds of the crowds, there is so much more that's going to be taking place this day. You see, this dawn is going to bring something far more than the promise of commerce, far more than the opportunity for wealth and for, and for luxury. It brings the promise of the Christ, of the Messiah. Jesus has come to Jericho, and there is a buzz all around. The crowd is swelling, and we see that there's anticipation that is all around, and it continues to gather and gather and gather in strength. See, the question that Jesus will be addressing is one that this crowd, even though they don't, they don't even realize it, they desperately need it. And there's going to be one person that the text is going to show us as the story and the narrative unfolds, needs it as much, if not more, than anyone. And you see, the squeeze of the multitude is almost claustrophobic. And you see, there are curious people that have come from all around, and they are elbow, elbowing their way into position. But for one man, elbows are not going to be enough. The text tells us that his name is Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he was a short man. And you know what? Short enough so that he can't actually see over the crowds. So short that he's going to have to climb 
a tree to get a glimpse of this r rumored Messiah or this rumored Christ. Somehow, this short man has survived growing up in a tall world, growing up the, with the, as the object of stares, growing up the brunt of jokes, growing up as the kid that was pushed around. But in this jostled process of growing up, part of his childhood was trampled or trodden underfoot. And that tender part of him died. It was crushed under the calloused and often cruel feet of the tall in a tall world. And yet he carries that stepped on part of his life everywhere that he goes. Even up the stout trunk of a sycamore tree. But somewhere along the way, to adulthood, as we look and listen to the wonder of this marvelous story, we see that Zacchaeus, as we turn the page and we look deeper, we have to read behind the lines and between the lines, and we understand that Zacchaeus learned to compensate. At first, to laugh at everybody's jokes, and then later to fight back. And so he climbed the professional ladder. And as he did so, he stepped on anyone that stood in his way. Anyone that was on the next rung above him, he would step on them and even crush them. He would show them all. Oh, someday, he would be the one looking down at them, and they would be looking up at him. And at last, we see according to this story, that he had made it all the way to the top. He was the chief tax collector, king of the hill, controlling commerce everywhere, king of the hill, greasing his, his greedy little palms with the sweat of other business people's brow, king of the hill, looking down, looking down, 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 down at all of Jericho. But you know what? The hill that he rules is a dung hill. I hate to be so crass, but that's what it was, at least in the eyes of the people. You see, tax collectors were so despised, you know, and they were, they were, little, they were little more than just ruthless bill collectors for a corrupt government. That was what the people thought. And even so much that the, the, the laws and the creeds and the doctrines of the Jewish people that we find recorded in the Talmud they looked down on them, allowing that a, a, any Jew could sanction a few things. And one is lying to a murderer, lying to a thief, and you get it, lying to a tax collector. So true, Zacchaeus has power. He has wealth. But the stature that he has sought has eluded him. And watch this. So has friendship. But Zacchaeus has heard the stories. He has heard the stories of this Jesus, who is a friend of tax collectors, who would eat and drink with them and stayed in their homes. He changed the life of Levi, the tax collector in Capernaum. He's heard those stories. For whom Levi left a lucrative career. He left everything, not for higher wages, but for no wages at all. This Jesus, this Jesus must have been some kind of man. That's what Zacchaeus is thinking of himself. Oh, my goodness. There's even talk that this Jesus author out the cities in the region and through the city of Jericho that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus was the Messiah. The thought captivates Zacchaeus. A Messiah who's a friend of tax collectors? A Messiah that would stay in their homes? And so with childlike eagerness, he shimmies himself up a sycamore to see him. Zacchaeus crawls all the way out on a limb. You could just see him, can't you? To get a better look. 
He marvels at the total lack of pomp and circumstances surrounding this Jesus, the Christ. Nothing at all like a king, and yet, perhaps just yet, everything like a king or like the king of the Jews or the Messiah should be. People are draped out windowsills like laundry that's hung out to dry. They're just waiting and watching. There's a thick, thick fringe that is gathering around every rooftop, and they're looking down, waiting for the Christ, waiting for the Messiah to come. And on the street, they are huddled of curious, from the holy men to the housewives, from the shopkeepers to the teachers, from the traders and businessmen to the bakers. They're all elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder. And then Jesus stops, and he looks up. And where does he look up? He looks up at that sycamore tree, and he sees Zacchaeus. And as though shafts of the Savior's love are kind of filtering all the way up through the branches, and this long-awaited dawn shines on this most despised of people, this tax collector. Can you just imagine it? It's as though the warmth begins to stir the soul of darkness that's in Zacchaeus' soul. And all eyes, you just could imagine, all eyes are following Jesus as Jesus, and it's like, it parts a sea of all the spectators as he walks closer on his way to that sycamore. And Zacchaeus feels the darkness of his soul shrinking back. For years, he has rendered unto Caesar, and now he must render unto Christ and give an account of himself. And guess what? He knows. He knows that, you know, that the soul knows that the account is not good. He, his ledger is filled with entries of money that's been extorted, of money that under the table, of money skimmed off to the top. Money, money, money. That was the bottom line for Zacchaeus, the bottom line for this chief of the tax collectors, the bottom line of a bankrupt life. But the Savior isn't looking for an audit. He's looking into something else. You see, he searches Zacchaeus' eyes as he looks up at him. And he's searching for what? That stepped on part of his life. And on it, he sees every footprint, every heel mark. And the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus is moved to compassion for the little boy who has had to grow up in a big man's world. Zacchaeus, he calls him by name and asks him for a place to stay. Zacchaeus looks into the eyes of the Messiah that search and far, the far reaches of his soul. And it, he looks and he sees that these eyes that are looking up at him are both that of a king and a friend. But you know, there's a lot going on in the story. There's a lot going on back then. There's a lot going on in that crowd. Ripples of contempt. Can you just feel them? Ripples of contempt are working their way through the crowd. Where did he say he's going? Hey, hey, where did he say he's going? Where is he going to stay? At his house? A tax collector's house? Zacchaeus's house? Eating with him? Eating with the sinner? But those whispered innuendos can't intrude this most holy and intimate of moments. In the same way that you would welcome a friend whom you have waited to see a long, long time, Zacchaeus jumps down from the sycamore tree and welcomes Jesus and takes him to his home. As his feet hit the ground, it is though a flood of repentant feelings burst forth. Feelings that had been dammed up for years. Zacchaeus goes out still on yet another limb, so to speak. What took a lifetime to accumulate in one sentence, don't miss it here, in one sentence here in the story, as we read it, 
as we feel it, as we are shocked by it, we have to be because what we see that takes place here is in the one sentence, devotion begins to liquidate. What do you mean liquidate? And not by a token 10% tithe, but half of all that he had to the poor and fourfold he would pay back to those that he had defrauded. Look closely into this story. Witness the miracle. It is a camel passing through the eye of a needle, as scripture says. Miraculous. Now, another dawn earlier, centuries before, right there, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down from the shout of Joshua's men. Today, another wall is tumbling down in Jericho. This time, at the offer of a king's friendship. This time, the walls that are crashing and tumbling down are that of a rich man's heart. And amid the rubble that crushed, stepped on part of this little man's heart, spring forth to life. And later, with each gracious gift to the poor, each payment back of restitution to those he defrauded, this little man's stature begins to increase and grow and grow and grow and grow. And first, at first, in the eyes of Jesus, but eventually, then in the eyes of all of Jericho. It's a marvelous story, isn't it? Aren't you glad you took the journey? But to fully understand what might not be apparent as we look at this story, it is the epitome that Jesus is the Savior. And he does it in ways just like that in Jericho, at the foot of a, a sycamore tree, calling down a tax collector, eating in his home, and calling out as he's already looked deep into his soul and deep into his heart, and he comes and he saves him and transforms him. But so often we miss it. And to fully understand Christ as Savior, I want to jump just a little bit further ahead in the story, in the story of the good news according to the gospel writer of Luke, to the 23rd chapter. There, all the way at the 39th verse, and we're going to see that it goes and it states, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Now, you've got to imagine the scene. Remember, he is there on the cross, and in the, the scriptures tell us, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, that's the heartbeat of all this passage of him on the cross. Jesus could have done that. He could have saved himself and shown the religious establishment that he was exactly who he said he was, the Messiah. He was the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was the chosen one, the promised seed of Eve through whom the curse of Eden would be reversed and it would be broken. He was the promised seed of Abraham through whom the entire earth would be blessed. He was the promised heir of David's throne through whom the kingdom of God was come. That is who Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah was. So many promises, do you not understand, converged there on the cross. And maybe, just maybe, there would still be one chance, even in that late hour, that they would come, to true, come true, and it would be uh, obvious to all, the, if only Jesus would save himself. But among the sneers are met... Only with what? Jesus' silence. You could hear a pin drop. And soon the rulers and the religious leaders, they lose taste for blood and they leave. Sometime later, though, the passage tells us, as we continue looking deeper and deeper into the narrative of this story, we see that uh, there are the soldiers that are making their rounds and stop at Jesus Christ's cross. They plop a bucket of sour wine down and on the ground, and they dip a sponge in it. And, the, and on the, the sponge, the stick on top of a hyssop branch, they go and they use it to mop the wounds. Jesus' body withers 
with the sting of alcohol. But they don't stop there. The soldiers laugh. And they sponge this prisoner down, betting that they can get the holy man to curse God. If he's not God, at least curse God. And at least, uh, and not God, then curse the day that he was born. But gee, no curses come. He curses neither. They push the sponge towards his mouth, and he turns away. Then one of the guttered mouth men cursed Jesus and mocked him with a second temptation. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus opens his swollen eyes and sees a blur of men that are below. What stories they could have told, because they would have been eyewitnesses. They could have gone to their supervisors if he had just come down and saved himself. They would have become like great evangelists that they would have made. Just to think about it, what revival would have bro broken out all in Rome, all across the globe, how Christianity would have flourished under government protection, how legislation would have been changed under Christian influence. It would have been unparalleled opportunity if only Jesus would save himself. But Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, doesn't save himself. He doesn't even save his dignity. He offers no defense. He makes no reply. Seeing little sport of his silence, the soldiers move on to the next cross, but Satan doesn't move. Hello. He stays exactly there working another strategy. Since Satan couldn't appeal to Jesus through the religious leaders, since Satan couldn't repeal, appeal to Jesus through the Roman soldiers, just maybe he could reach him through one of the robbers. Since Christ knew the pain that the men were going through, maybe a dying man suffering, you know, would, you know kind of get to him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us, is what was said. Slowly, Jesus turns his head to the man who insulted him. He sees in this man's eyes are lit up with anger. Anger at life for bringing him here. Anger at Rome for putting him up there. Anger at Jesus for leaving him there. How simple it would have been for Jesus to ease the burn in the soul of that inflames in this man's eyes. How easy it would have been for Jesus had he has done so many times before. You got to think back to the garrison demoniac and the fire that was extinguished when Jesus expelled those demons from the desert of the man's soul. You have to think back to the woman who was at the well and how Jesus gave living water that he offered that quenched the desperate thirst of her soul. He could stop all the fire in this man's soul and the fever in his wounds and the man next to him as well if only Jesus would save himself and us. But Jesus knows something that the man hanging next to him doesn't. He knows that he would have to choose one or the other. He couldn't save himself or he could save us, but he couldn't do both. See, there would have to be a sacrifice, and Jesus knew that from the foundation before time. And in spite of how much pain he was in, in spite of how much dread he was suffering, how weak he was, how alone he was, he had strength still to choose. See, it was the struggle that Jesus had in the wilderness when he was first tempted three times with these three, that matched these three temptations there on the cross that prepared for Jesus for suffering on the cross as the suffering servant, as the suffering Messiah, as the suffering Christ, giving him the strength not to give in and the strength and courage not to come down and the selflessness to save us instead of saving himself. When I think of Jesus Christ Jesus the Christ, Jesus as the Savior of our lives. All I can do is be moved to, to prayer. And I invite you to pray with me right now. If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, 
or if you have before, but you have not been living in the reality that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, with me, will you just simply confess? Like, I'm going to confess that my, sta- my, my, sta- you know, my, uh, my striving for spiritual stature needs to be saved. I want to see you, Lord Jesus. I want to see you as the Christ. I want to see you as the Messiah. For I want to be able to see you for who you really are. See you for myself, in my own eyes, in the eyes of my heart. Not just through the eyes of a pastor or evangelist or a teacher or a missionary. I want to be able to see you for myself. Like Zacchaeus, who had heard so much about you. And there was questions, Lord Jesus, of was it opinion? Was it hearsay? How much of it was true? But I want to know you like he knew you for myself. I want to hear you with my own ears, not simply from a book, not simply from television or the internet or social media. I want to experience you as my savior of my soul. I'm tired of secondhand experiences. I'm tired of religion, Lord Jesus. I want to feel with my own heart who you are. I don't mind even being like Zacchaeus and climbing a tree awkwardly, undignified if I have to. I will gladly do it. Please come near to me, Lord Jesus. I will be the one out on the limb waiting Forgive me for trying to save myself and not relying on you to save me. Let me be in full awe and appreciation that you could have answered the religious leaders there 2,000 years ago there on the cross and come down. You could have answered the soldiers and come down from the cross. You could have answered the thief that was cursing and mocking you and come down from the cross and save yourself first. But you chose not to do it, but to be the sacrificial offering that was required because of my sin. And you stayed on the cross, dying that my sins might be forgiven forever, that my life might be forever abundant and true. I pray that this day that I would understand that you are Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus who is the Savior, who saves me. And for all that have heard your word unfolded today, would that be the decision of their heart? For them quickly to just do an ABC that they will accept that you died for their sins, that they would believe in your heart that you are the Christ and the Messiah and the only one that could save them and confess with their heart that you are Lord, I pray for all those that have actually already made this decision but have not been living in the reality that you are the Savior of their soul, Savior of the world. Perhaps because like Zacchaeus, they've had their heart that's been stepped upon and those heels have crushed it. Save every part of them. Redeem them fully today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for listening and participating. We trust if you said yes to Jesus Christ, you could see that there on the screen, there's a way that you can contact us. And we're going to just ask you to to reach out. And uh, here's our contact information. And we'd love to talk with you and pray with you. We want to invite you to come when you feel comfortable to come in person to be with us here in Northport. But no matter where you're at, Just know that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah, and he is Savior, not just for me, but for you as well. God bless you. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next time.